Okay. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to BC 214, our course on uh, developing the human spirit. We're going to take a moment to pray and then we will get started. May I request somebody in the class to please pray with us and then we will start. You can you hear my mic and audio is okay? Yeah. Yes, Pastor. Okay, great. Go ahead, somebody can pray and we'll start, please. Father, we want to thank you for this morning. Lord, we pray and ask for your presence to be with us as we go to continue to learn. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you would speak to us, help us to understand the things of the Spirit, and help us to walk in the Spirit, Lord Jesus. Um, let's uh, we pray, O oh Lord, that we would have a very blessed time of learning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining. So, in our previous lesson, we were talking about how the human spirit affects the soul and body. That means what is going on in our spirit is experienced in the soul and body. And that's why we went through a quite an exhaustive list of things that we see in scripture of how uh, you know the, the interconnectedness between spirit soul and body so we went through that and then we also looked uh, at the fact that if we can be strong uh, healthy whole in our spirit then that will come out, uh, affect us in a very positive way. Out of the abundance of the heart, you know, we can bring forth, we can give birth to in our lives. Uh, we also spoke a little bit about the importance of words, how the words we speak affect the human spirit, the words we hear, and as well as what comes out of our mouth, the impact our own selves. And so we have to be careful. And then, towards the end of the last class, we were talking about the analogies. And I just want to go through this one more time because this helps us, uh, uh, you know, learn how to operate out of our spirit and that we will be getting into it as we progress. But this gives a good foundation for that. So in the Bible, uh, we see different analogies or comparisons of the human spirit. It means um, the human spirit is compared to something. And we've listed out some of these things. And if we understand that comparison, uh, then it shows us, okay, therefore I should treat my human spirit and I should live out of my human spirit in this manner. So first we said, the human spirit is like a house, it's the dwelling place of God. So that means you take care of your spirit the way you take care of a house. You keep it clean. Uh, you only permit inside what you want. Um, and you guard that house. You keep things away, like you don't let any random person get into your house. And you know you keep the doors locked, or windows are safe. Uh, and inside that house, you keep all the things that matter to you. So like that, you take care of your spirit, because your spirit is a house where God dwells. The spirit is a lamp, meaning a uh, lamp or, you know, you could say torch light or a light, a source of light. Uh, so light illuminates, it gives us guidance, it shows us the path in which we have to go. So that guidance, which is given to us through the lamp, the human spirit is a, a lamp. So guidance from God, of course, comes to us through our spirit, through the lamp of our spirit. So when we want guidance, what do we do? Listen to God in your spirit. Uh, the spirit is also a place of deposit. That means you store things there. And then out of that deposit comes out, uh, you know, uh, good things. So a deposit means you're intentionally putting, you know, so we understand example deposit in terms of money. Okay, you put a deposit in the bank, you're putting it there. Why? Something that's valuable, you put it there, you deposit it. 
So like that, your spirit is deposit, your place of deposit. You put into your spirit, you put the word, you put good things into your spirit because it, from there, you know, you can withdraw when you need to. The fourth lady, we said the spirit is a spring, meaning from there comes out what is going to shape our lives. So uh, we know from uh, our spirit come the forces that shape our lives. So we, 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 we not only strength, we strengthen our spirit so that the forces that come out will be the right kinds, you know, uh, the, the right kind of things that are produced by the Word of God and by the Holy Spirit. Those will be the forces that spring out of our spirit. The spirit is our womb. So that's where you give birth to things. So that's where we pray. So we can say we conceive in our spirit, you know, whatever God wants to release on the earth. We engage with God in prayer. We get his vision. And that, that whole uh, development takes place in the womb of our spirit. And then it is released on the earth. The spirit is also like a ground. It's a place where we sow the seed, and if you sow the seed, you know you'll get the harvest. So you'll be engaged in that process. There are things you sow into your heart. You say, God, I'm sowing this into my heart because I want that harvest. So you sow the seed, and you know you'll get the harvest. Um, the last two things that we saw, um, the, our spirit is where the Word of God, the things of God can be written upon. You know, that means what's in our spirit uh, uh, if it is written in our spirit, it cannot be taken away from us. Right? So we receive the things of God, the truth of God into our spirit. Let it be written on the table of our hearts. Similarly, when we're ministering to people, that's what we want to see happen. We want to see God's word written into their heart. Right? So if you put something in their heart, then it will be with them for the rest of their lives. The last thing we saw was that the human spirit is like a vessel. It's a container. Right? It's a vessel. That means if we let God fill it up, then we can pour out, right? So we can pour out whatever we have received from God. So we go before God so that God can fill us up. Then we pour out to people what God has put inside of us. Or you can say, you know, it's a vessel that God can use. You know, God can pour out of this vessel as he wants to bless people. And that spirit, our spirit is a vessel. So it's our spirit that we present before God and say, God, you fill me and you pour into me. So when we understand these ana analogies or comparisons, it shows us how to you know, work with our spirit, how we can develop our spirit so that we can serve the purposes of God. Okay. So any questions on that before we go into the next lesson? Any questions? Any thoughts on that? So the verse which we see in Galatians, um, so into the spirit, uh, this is also in line with what we deposit. Yes, yeah. So uh, Paul writes in Galatians, like if you sow to the flesh, you will off the flesh reap corruption. But if you sow to the spirit, you'll off the spirit reap life everlasting. So that means we are investing into the, into the spirit, into the things of the spirit. And as we do that, we will reap the good rewards of uh, investing in the spirit. Yeah. So it can we can we can connect it to what we have just looked at. Good. So let's move now to our next lesson. And what I want to now bring our attention to and to think about is how our spirit actually connects with the unseen world, the spiritual realm. And this is very important because now we are kind of moving into the direction of, okay, I want God to work through me. Now this is how it's going to happen. Right? That means our human spirit gives us the capacity to connect with the spiritual realm. Now, we can understand it, of course, from, from both sides. That means uh, a person who's a believer and a person who's not a believer. Uh, a person who's not a believer, you know, people who practice black magic, witchcraft, do evil things, they, in their spirit, they're connecting to the dark side. 
of the spiritual world, right? So they're connected to demonic powers and they get their powers from that. So we are aware of it and we're not we're not going to explore that. We're leaving that aside. But what we are saying is, as believers, our spirit, human spirit, engages with God. You know, and God by his Holy Spirit will work in us and through us, starting in the spirit. So God works in the human spirit, and he also works through the human spirit. Now we're talking about the born again person. We're talking about the believer, right? We're in, in all of in all of this chapter, that's the context. So uh, we saw, for example, uh, the human spirit is a lamp. Well, the Bible also says that the Lord will light our lamp. That means in the spirit, he is going to give us light. So the breath of the Almighty, the inspiration of the Almighty can inspire us, stir us up, give us understanding, give us wisdom in the spirit, in the human spirit. So that means God himself is interacting with my spirit or with your spirit. Right? God is interacting with us, spirit to spirit. God is spirit. We are created as spirit beings. So God who is spirit is interacting with my spirit. So this is where God interacts. Now, of course, God can touch our soul, our feelings. God can touch our body, of course. God can do that. But the primary way is God works with us spirit to spirit. He's interacting with us in the spirit. Um, now, the spirit of man, 1 Corinthians 2, 11 and 12 says, what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of man which is in him? That means my human spirit knows everything about me. The spirit of God, he knows everything about God. He is God. And so he is now imparting to my spirit. So it's really God interacting with me in my spirit. And it is in my spirit that God gives me understanding, revelation, and so on. He knows everything, and he's imparting that knowledge to me in my spirit. Right? So what can we say? What do we see in Scripture? Here are a few thought, uh, things we see. Romans 8, 14, and 16, 14 through 16. The spirit bears witness with our spirit. You know, to bear witness means he testifies. He gives evidence. He brings conviction there. In our spirit, the Holy Spirit bears witness with my spirit. The Holy Spirit gives conviction to my spirit. The Holy Spirit gives evidence to my spirit. The Holy Spirit testifies to, he's speaking to my spirit. The Holy Spirit gives revelation to our human spirit. And some of the things that Jesus said is, he will teach you all things. He will bring all things to your remembrance. He will guide you into all truth. And again, First John 2, he teaches us all things. So where is the Holy Spirit teaching me? Where is the Holy Spirit bringing to my remembrance? Where is the Holy Spirit guiding me into all truth? It is in my spirit. Right. So the Holy Spirit is teaching your spirit. The Holy Spirit is bringing to your remembrance in your spirit. The Holy Spirit is guiding you into all truth. He's showing you things to come in your spirit because the spirit bears witness with your spirit. And your human spirit has the capacity to receive this and then release it to our mind. So our mind understands it and then we decide, okay, this is how we are going to process things right the third thing we also see is we learn about the fruit of the spirit so this is things which the holy spirit works in my spirit and then it is produced out of my spirit Right? So the fruit of the Spirit is really 
can also be stated as the fruit of the human spirit. Why? Because it is actually we who bear the fruit, not the Holy Spirit. And Jesus said, I am the wine, you are the branches, and we know it's the branches that bring forth fruit. So it is the branches that bear fruit. So really, this is the fruit of the Holy Spirit working in the human spirit, the spirit of the born-again believer, and it is then expressed through the born again believer. Right? So the, it's the Holy Spirit who gives us the ability to love, to walk in joy, to walk in peace, and uh, to walk in self control and faith and all of that. So the Holy Spirit works that into our spirit and then we express it. Right? So the fruit of the Spirit doesn't happen independent of our spirit. It's not like the Holy Spirit comes and says, hello, get out of the way, I will show myself and, you know, I will, I will show love and joy and peace and all that. No, 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 no. The Holy Spirit is working that into our spirit. Then through our spirit, love, joy, peace is expressed through each of us. Right? So the fruit of the Spirit is really the work of the Holy Spirit in our spirit expressed through each believer. So each believer has to give the Holy Spirit the opportunity to work in our human spirit, dealing with us, and then we can express the fruit of the Spirit. And also, when it comes to ministry, that's the same thing. Jesus said, out of our innermost being, out of our belly, will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the Holy Spirit. Right. So the rivers of living water are representing the presence in the it represents the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. But where out of our innermost being, this will flow. Right? So it's not flowing outside the believer. It's flowing through the believer. Right? That means it's coming out of our spirit. That means our human spirit becomes the conduit. It becomes the channel through which the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit is being released. So if you can think of these water pipes you know that people lay on the roadside i mean the the water supply board they dig the ground they put the water pipes all around like so our human spirit is like those water pipes right it is through those that the rivers of living water are flowing that the holy spirit works and obviously we can understand you know the bigger the the, the smaller the pipe little less water bigger the pipe more more can flow so if our, we can develop our spirit to let more of the presence of the holy spirit flow and it'll be a blessing to people. First Corinthians 12 talks about the gifts of the Spirit. And yes, the gifts of the Spirit, like the fruit of the Spirit, they are the work of the Spirit, but it is happening through the human spirit, through the, the spirit of the believer. The Holy Spirit is working through the believer. So in all of these uh true so in all of these aspects we said it is god working through the born again spirit right so that's something to keep in mind now that the holy spirit is engaging so much or he's seeking to engage so much with me in my spirit now think about this. If believers don't understand this, and instead they are waiting for the Holy Spirit to, you know, do something in their mind or do something in their body, they're you know they're waiting for the Holy Spirit to do something in the soul and in the body, and they're not sensitizing their own spirit to the work of the Holy Spirit, then then we can actually miss out on so much of these things. We can miss out on the witness of the Spirit. Uh, we can miss out on the teaching, the revelation, the Holy Spirit gives. We can even miss out on the fruit of the Spirit. We can miss out on the work of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit. You know, because if the believer doesn't know the Holy Spirit is working through my Spirit, they're just waiting for something to happen in the mind, the emotion. Or if I feel it, then it is God. If I understand it, then it is God. Uh, you know, if God touches my body, uh, 
Well, if you're putting God only in the soul and the body, well, whereas He mainly wants to work in our spirit, we will be missing out so much of the work of the spirit. So that's why th this understanding is so important. Are we all together so far? Any questions? All good? OK. Now, in the same light, I just want to bring up a question that has come up in the past. If God is working in the spirit of man, does God harden the human heart? And uh, 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 an example that is often pointed to is that of Pharaoh. You know, uh, did Pharaoh or did God harden Pharaoh's heart? And if that was the case, then does it mean we are all like robots or puppets in God's hands that He can just play with our spirit and, you know, when he wants to harden us, he hardens us. When he wants to soften us, he softens us. Are we like that? Or what actually is happening? So we need to understand this correctly, right? We need to, uh, let me see. I think somebody raised the hand on the chat. Oh, Collins, yes. You, you want to say something, Collins? I thought it was a question to ask Pastor, but it's okay oh. if you can't continue. <laughs> <laughs> Not a problem. Not a problem. Thank yeah, thank you. Right. So, you know, how do we understand this? Because in the scriptures we see, especially in, in the dealings of God's dealing with Pharaoh, um, what actually happened? What we will see, and I've given you the verses in Exodus 7, 8, 9, that in the initial stage, as God began to reveal his miracles through Moses, it was Pharaoh who was choosing to harden his heart. That is chapter 7, 8, and 9. Pharaoh chose, oh, I don't want to, I don't accept this is God. My magicians can also do it. My people can also do it. Maybe Moses is playing tricks, you know, whatever. So Pharaoh was hardening his own heart. He was making that choice to refuse to recognize God was at work. And then as things progressed, we see in Exodus 9, 10, 11, 14, the scripture saying, the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. Now that's a very confusing phrase because it's almost like God is playing double games. He's hardening Pharaoh's heart and then he's saying, ah, uh -uh, see, you are so stubborn. I'm making you stubborn and God saying, I'm calling you stubborn. Now that's not fair. If God made him stubborn, then God has no right to call him stubborn. Hey God, you only made him stubborn. Right? So, how do we understand this? Well, look at the what preceded all this. What preceded all this? Chapter 7, 8, and 9. Pharaoh was hardening his heart. So, as we can see in other places in scripture, God gave him up. So, okay, that's the way you want to go? You go. So, in that sense, we understand the Lord. Hardened Pharaoh's heart, meaning he let him continue to go on in that direction. How do we understand that? We see the same thing in Romans 1, 24, 26, and 28. In Romans 1, 24, 26, and 28, it says that the people, even though they saw the glory of God, they saw all the creation, they chose not to. So who did the choosing? The people. They chose not to recognize God as God, but they, they changed the glory of the incorruptible God into that which is made or created. And what did God do? 
God gave them up okay. or he gave them over that means he said look you want to go you go right so it's not like God pushed them to go they started going in that direction and God said if that's the direction you want to go you go that's Romans 1 24 26 28 so God gave them up so we understand God's dealings with people in this manner. When, when, when the scripture is saying, Pharaoh hardened his own heart, uh, uh, Pharaoh hardened his heart in the beginning, then later it says God hardened his heart, then we need to understand it as, it's not God manipulating the person. It's not God using the person as a puppet, but it is God letting him go on in the path he originally chose to go in chapter 7, 8, and uh, 9, then 9, 10, 11, 14, God says, Fine, you continue on in that direction. So he let him continue on to become stubborn and insensitive. And that, in that process, God was actually going to work something out, which is he ultimately brought, you know, uh, he came to Exodus 12 where he, uh, he, he did the the tenth miracle, which was the the Passover, and with that Pharaoh broke. You know, he said he told the people, "Just leave now, leave right now," and and he kind of almost sent them out of Egypt in in a hurry, right? So, if you know, if if God was the one who was uh, hardening Pharaoh's heart, then it would be unfair for God to find fault with Pharaoh. Right? But the fact is, you know, God is pointing, you know, Paul points out, points this out in Romans 9 20. And 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 he says, you know, uh, God 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 pointed to Pharaoh's heart, hardened heart. And says, okay, Pharaoh, I've raised you up so that my glory can be seen. But the choice to harden his heart, that was Pharaoh's choice. Not God forcing him to do it. We can think about the same thing when it comes to Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot. God foreknew, and I'm just using one more example, and so God foreknew that Judas is going to betray Jesus. But we cannot say God made Judas betray Jesus. Because if God made Judas to do that, then Judas has a very strong argument. He'll say, God, I am a bigger savior than Jesus. Because if I had not betrayed Jesus, Jesus would never have been crucified. The world would not have been saved. So I am a greater servant than Jesus because I allowed you to use me to betray Jesus and put Jesus on the cross. And if I had not done it, Jesus would never have gone to the cross. So Judas can have a big argument with God, saying, uh, I am a greater servant. No. So it wasn't like God used, God made Judas betray Jesus. The, the betrayal of Jesus was entirely Judas's choice, but God knew it ahead of time. And that's why he spoke to the prophet, saying that Jesus would be sold for 30 pieces of silver, that a friend of his own house would lift his heel against him. He would be betrayed by his own in the house of his own friends. He spoke ahead of them, declaring what Judas would do. But that doesn't mean God made Judas do it. That was completely a choice that Judas made. Right? Similarly, going back to Pharaoh, while God was working out his plan through that, through all of those incidents. It wasn't God making Pharaoh uh, do it, but rather God worked in that 
process. Well, Pharaoh hardened his own heart. God let him do it. And in the process, God carried out his purpose. Right? So we must be careful. Can God influence the human heart? Of course he can. Can he move upon the human heart? Yes, he can. But the ultimate choice is the person's. Right? So we cannot turn around and say, um, you know, God forced me to do it. No, God will influence us. God will move upon us. He will direct us. He will pull upon our hearts. But we have to yield to him. We have to say yes to it and yield to it. Okay. So even when it comes to leaders, God will direct their hearts. But then it's the individual who says, okay, God, I will do this. They recognize the stirring and they yield to it. Like King Cyrus yielding to the stirring in his heart to issue a decree for the people to go back. So let me pause here and see if there are any questions on this, any thoughts on this, any uh, any dis points you want to discuss on this. Uh, but in case of uh, while praying for people who have not accepted the Lord, especially from our families, um, can we pray that give them a heart of flesh or uh, a heart to understand God? Or how yes. exactly do we pray? Uh, yes. So we definitely pray and say, God, move upon their hearts and we pray God open so what has happened now is that the, the eyes of their heart or their understanding uh, it has been darkened right the God of this world has blinded their understanding their mind so we say God open their understanding let the light of the gospel shine into their hearts Right. Let them see, or let them, you know, let them know and understand Jesus Christ. So we are praying, God, move upon their hearts, open the eyes of their understanding, help them to know Jesus Christ, know their heart to know Jesus Christ. So, example, Isaiah fifty four thirteen says, "All your, you know, I'm just doing an example here." God, God Isaiah fifty four thirteen says all your children will be taught by the lord and grateful the peace of your children interestingly in john chapter 6 jesus quotes isaiah 54 13 and says everyone who is taught by my father comes to me very interesting right so isaiah said all your children will be taught by the lord and grateful be the peace Jesus quotes Isaiah in John 6, I think it's verse 45, and he says, everyone who's taught by the Father comes to me. Okay? So how will people come to Jesus? They need to be taught by the Father. That means, God, you intervene. God, you open their eyes. God, you reveal Jesus to their hearts. So then they will come to Christ. Jesus said, no man comes to me except the Father draw him. So he said, Lord, you draw their hearts. You pull upon their hearts so that they will come to Jesus Christ. So that's how we pray. Right? We pray, we also pray against any the hindrances of the enemy in their minds, right? So that's what the enemy does. He puts things in the minds of people to blind their minds. You know, so we pull down strongholds, we cast down imaginations, things in the in the mind. So we said we take authority over every deception, every lie, every untruth, every uh, philosophy, you know, that the enemy has put in the minds of the people blinding them we tear it down we declare the truth of god being released into their minds so we are asking god to work upon their hearts and we are enforcing christ's victory over what the enemy does in their minds it's yeah. Master, yeah. thank you yeah. um, i have a doubt yeah, yeah go ahead Jephina. yeah so in in romans chapter 9 uh, verse 16 to uh, 18 we see that uh, therefore God uh, depend on man's desire or effort but on God's mercy for the scripture says to Pharaoh I raised you up for this very purpose that I might display my power in you that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth therefore God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy and he hardens whom he wants to harden so uh, under the light that I mean under what we learn now, uh, it, it this seems quite uh, quite contradictory to me. I have skipped 
this chapter a lot of time when i read romans so so uh, how you will explain this uh, scripture over here with what we learned right now yeah okay yeah, yeah so uh, what what i was uh, explaining is so romans 9 paul is uh, talking about pharaoh uh, he's al- he's also talking about previously is talking about jacob and esau uh, then he was talking uh, he's talking about pharaoh and then in that he's also talking about the potter and the clay and then he goes to talk about uh, the jewish people right so um, there are four com- four um, examples he's using he's saying jacob and esau so in jacob and esau so if you look at all four so in jacob and esau God said Jacob I have loved Esau I have hated and he said this even before they were born yeah so does that mean Esau was predetermined to behave the way he did or so how do we interpret it like how do we understand it so there are two ways right the question we have to ask is god said jacob i have loved esau i have hated so does it mean therefore even before esau was born god had decided that he has going to he's going to behave like this or does it mean god foreknew how esau was going to behave and therefore he could say before time i like what jacob is going to do and i don't like what esau is going to do so we have both you know we we have to ask that question so in the same way pharaoh when god says i have raised you up that i might show you show my power does it mean god has dictated his behavior and then show his power or god is showing his power in spite of his behavior right so understand that same thing potter and the clay the one difference between the potter and the clay is the clay is a lifeless thing whereas in the case of people as in esau of pharaoh they are not like the clay in the sense they are people who have their own ability to choose the clay doesn't have that ability so the potter shapes the vessel and the vessel also paul's argument is uh the vessel can't say to the potter you know why are you shaping me like this but we have to keep in mind there's one big difference the clay has no power of choice the clay is a lifeless thing whereas esau has the power of choice he had the power of choice pharaoh had the power of choice and then in the rest of the chapter he comes to the jewish people right and so he says you know what about the jews and the gentiles the jews also had the power of choice they could choose god had a plan for them god wanted to release the gospel through them um, they had the choice but they chose to reject jesus it wasn't god made them reject jesus they chose to and through that god actually expanded the gospel to the gentiles god already had a plan to get the gospel to the gentiles so uh he quotes many verses you know like that even beforehand god had a plan to get the gospel to the gentiles but it doesn't mean, and 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 we know the choice the jews made to reject jesus but does it mean god made them reject jesus they had a choice but god foretold that through them through the jews the gospel will go to the gentiles so uh we have to understand romans 9 in the context 
of the fact that every person has the freedom to choose. If we take that away and then make every person just a lump of clay, then we are not uh, people created with the freedom to choose. Okay. So that's the difference. So we have to, um, so in our process of interpreting Romans 9, we have to say, God declared ahead of time because he knew what Esau would choose, but the choice Esau made was his choice. And that is what the writer of Hebrews brings up. You know, he says, Esau sold his birthright for the sake of porridge, bowl of porridge. He sold, that was his choice. And so the writer of Hebrews says, don't be like that. Hebrews 12. Same thing with Pharaoh. That means we have to put Pharaoh in the same category. That means Pharaoh made the choice, but God worked through that or in that situation to display his glory. The Jewish people made their choice, but through that, God worked out his purpose, which is to get the gospel to the Gentiles. But the choice was the responsibility of these people. That's how we should correctly interpret. Now, I have to admit that there is the other side. So there are two points of view. And, and, and you know, when we study Romans in, in our third year, when we go through Romans, this will come out again. That there is the Calvinistic view, which is like, God determined their choice. That means we are saying human beings are like clay. And no choice. So that's that's one view, you know, of one stream of theology. But then it doesn't, my feeling is it doesn't hold up for the rest of scripture. Because, you know, that means you can go back to Adam and say, hey, God made Adam eat the fruit. It was it wasn't Adam's choice. God made him do it, you know. So that would not be right, right? Uh, it was Adam's choice, and that's why God could say, hey, you did the wrong thing. Yeah. So uh, I think to understand, that's why I started, uh, to, to understand this uh, correctly, you know, uh, we make the choice, but God works through all of that. Yeah? Okay. I hope... The, um, and the others in the class um, understood it. Any questions on that? Okay. Let's just go a little forward uh, in this chapter, and, uh, and then we'll continue this next week. So the next thing we, we want to talk about is um, spiritual experiences in Scripture. So... Knowing that our human spirit is the place where God interacts with us, and our human spirit is a place where we interact with God in the spiritual realm, we can therefore you know, look at different spiritual experiences in Scripture right? and then say, hey, uh, we, we too can be open to those things. Now, think about Moses where God would reveal himself to Moses uh, in this thick cloud. He would hear uh, God speak to him. And uh, uh, Moses was in the cloud for 40 days and 40 nights. And when Moses uh, entered the tabernacle, there was a pillar of cloud. And um, and the glory of God manifested and rested upon the tabernacle. So, and of course, I understand th these are all in the Old Testament. But what we are seeing is in Moses and his walk with God, there were visible, tangible expressions of the presence of God. 
specifically this cloud, fire, Moses having unusual experience of his face glowing, Moses being for 40 days and nights, 40 days without food, supernaturally empowered by God. So, um, these are real experiences that, you know, that Moses had. And uh, spiritual experiences, meaning he was in this physical world, but yet the spiritual realm was manifesting in the tangible phys physical world. God's presence being visible in a cloud, and uh, Moses being able to stay in that glory, and the pillar of cloud, pillar of fire, and the glory of God resting on the tabernacle. So, can the spiritual realm be expressed in the natural realm? The answer is yes. Yeah. Can the spiritual realm become visible in our natural realm? And we've just picked up one example here. We can look throughout the Bible. And the answer is yes. And the, the God is spirit. He's working with us in the spirit. But when he chooses to, he can also express himself in very tangible ways. And in the examples we have seen here, in the case of Moses, Exodus 19, 24, and uh, 33, and also in 40, the spiritual presence of God is expressed physically in the form of a cloud. So, just a thought here, and we will pick this up next week. The thought is, the spiritual can become, exp can be expressed in the natural, in whatever way God chooses. It doesn't only have to be a club. In this particular case, we are just given all the references of a cloud. You know, no, no, that cloud was not the natural cloud as we know it but it is the spiritual expressing itself in the natural. And if God wants to do it again, He can do it. We just have to be open to that. Okay. So let's pause here. We'll pick this up again next week and take this forward. We'll look at some spiritual experiences of Isaiah and Ezekiel and others and say, look, let's be open to these expressions, where the spiritual expresses itself in the natural. Okay, So let's pause here for today. Um, I just request somebody to close in prayer. I will pick this up next week, um, take this forward. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you under the name of Jesus. We thank you uh, for this day. We thank you for the class that we had. We thank you that you're a God who wants to engage with our spirit, Lord. God, your love is so amazing that when we learn more about how you want to work with us, how you want to be in such an intimate relationship with us, we stand in awe of your love, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus, that you're always being with us, working in our spirit. And we really thank you for the spirit that you have given us. God, help us to understand this truth that we are not just living this life, but we are. We should work in the spirit. We should develop in our spirit. And we should reflect you uh, to other people on this life as we learn more about this course. Uh, help us to put it 
uh, into practice so that we can shine more for you so that we can shine your light to others so what you have poured in our spirit we can pour it out on others and be a blessing to others lord we love you and we thank you in jesus name i pray amen amen thank you thank you everyone we'll continue this next week god bless thank you pastor thank you